Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar entitled Cover Crop Termination, Herbicide Considerations During Establishment and Termination. My name is Anna Goodjohn's daughter, and I'm the team member at the Partnership for Ag Resource Management, who is hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by my colleague, Dr. Thomas Green, president and co-founder of the IPM Institute, who will provide a brief introduction. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker. Today we'll hear from Dr. Bill Curran, Professor of Plant Science at Penn State University. At the end of his presentation, we will use the remaining time for Q&A. Before we begin, I wanted to share some brief logistics. You will re remain muted as an audience member during the presentations, but please make use of the question box on your screen to type questions for Bill. I will moderate the questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available later on partnershipfarm.org. By attending the webinar today, you will be eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for crop management, and 0.5 for soil and water management. You must be present for the entire one-hour webinar to receive those points. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive an email by the end of the day with the webinar recording and a link to submit survey evaluations. A link and pop-up question will be provided at the end of this webinar to submit CCA credentials to earn points. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please be sure to watch through the Citrix platform and not YouTube to receive credit. A link to register on Citrix will be provided in the text below the YouTube recording or it will be emailed to you if you've already registered for this webinar. You're provided instructions at the end of this presentation to submit your credentials. And now with those logistics taken care of, I will turn it over to Dr. Thomas Green. Thanks so much, Anna, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So the Partnership for Ag Resource Management is an effort of our nonprofit IPM Institute, along with many other projects in agriculture and communities, each focused on using the power of the marketplace to improve sustainability. We're currently a team of 24 based in Madison, Wisconsin, working to increase adoption of best practices and improve outcomes in health, environment, and economics, all key elements of sustainability. We write regularly on IPM and other topics for Crops and Soils magazine. We also work with pest control companies, hospitals, schools, and other facilities and communities, and with food companies and farmers around the world to improve practices and communicate those benefits to buyers and the public. Our goal with the Partnership for Ag Resource Management is to identify revenue opportunities for ag retailers that help keep our valuable ag resources on cropland to help promote those products and services, and then track and report sales and estimate reductions in losses of nutrients and other inputs uh, as a result. Next slide. So in multiple watersheds, including the Great Lakes, Mississippi River, Chesapeake Bay, uh, nutrient and soil resources we need for our crops are leaving cropland and ending up in our rivers, lakes, and streams. The two photos show what happens when we get too much phosphorus, feeding blooms of algae, which close beaches to swimming, make fishing a challenge, and have also shut down public water supplies. The NOAA graph on the left shows annual data on the severity of the algal bloom since 2002. After phosphorus loadings declined sharply in the mid-1980s with the advent of reduced tillage, they've increased over the last 15 years. Uh, 2015 was a record, uh, and 2016 was about a third of that. So it varies a lot uh, depending on weather conditions, but we know that the phosphorus is coming primarily from cropland because of the timing of the loads. They spike during snow melt and rain events in winter and early spring following fall applications. The increase in recent years has been in dissolved phosphorus rather than phosphorus attached to soil particles. And along with that increase, Heidelberg University and others have documented a concentration of phosphorus in the top layer of soil. 
where years of surface applications in rotational no-till systems have resulted in saturation of that soil with phosphorus and an inability to hold more. And as a consequence, we've seen the increased runoff plus movement down through macropores uh, into and then out of tile drain systems and into waterways. Next slide. So ag retailers have valuable products and services that can heat phosphorus on cropland and out of waterways. Here's a list of some of those, along with some very rough average reductions based on published studies. There's lots of variability in those published numbers of phosphorus loss reductions based on things like soil type, slope, proximity to surface water, and other factors, but these rough averages give us a sense of where we can likely make a difference with our products and services. So we're cover crops, soil testing, grid or zone sampling, and variable rate application, and custom application are all opportunities for ag retailers to make revenue and also reduce phosphorus losses and improve water quality. We can also let farmers know when a broadcast application is made so that they can get out there and get the application lightly covered. We can avoid application before heavy rain events, abide by setbacks, uh, and let farmers know when we see an issue that needs attention, like a tile drain blowout. And then also applying just enough phosphorus for the following crop, rather than laying down uh, phosphorus for the next several crops in the rotation, can also make a difference. So today we'll hear more uh, from Bill about strategies to manage cover crops effectively, particularly how to be successful terminating the crop for maximum benefit to the following crop. Next slide. So ag retailers are making a difference. So as I mentioned, what we're doing is identifying beneficial products and services, uh, and then we promote those working with ag retailers. And then we do an annual survey to track the sales of those products and services. Uh, and so here you see some good increases in things like soil sampling and variable rate application uh, that are making a difference. In 2015, we started a program securing funding uh, for ag retailers to offer a discount on variable rate to farmers. And that's been helping support this increase. We had 13 retailers and 95 growers participate in 2015, and then this past year we expanded to three additional watersheds in northwestern Ohio. So using the published estimates that we showed previously, the acres of VRT here alone represent 1.1 million pounds of phosphorus that's been prevented from leading cropland uh, into waterways. We need to track and report the improvements we're making so that regulators and the public are aware of the voluntary efforts uh, that ag retailers and farmers are making using the power of the marketplace to drive improvement. You'll hear more from Anna about some additional tools and resources we have for you to use as we work to achieve these goals. With that, I'd like to turn the mic back to Anna. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, as Tom mentioned, we do have some free resources available on our website, partnershipfarm.org. On the left, you can see the front page of our agronomist handbook that is available free for download. On the right, you can see the front and back of our phosphorus loss reduction wallet card, uh, which can be ordered for free on our website as well. These serve as a great conversation starter with your growers. Uh, lots of people order them and take them to their various meetings. To date, we have distributed more than 20,000 wallet cards. I also have a couple of PARM announcements. As Tom mentioned, our 2016 Great Lakes Ag Retailer Products and Services Survey is still open, and a link to participate will be included in the follow-up emails. Our goal is to track ag retail sales of products and services that keep ag inputs on cropland and out of the Great Lakes. By selling valuable products and services, including soil sampling, precision ag, and cover crops, ag retailers are making a difference. Thank you to the many of you who have already taken the survey. Those who haven't, please take a little time to share your experience. The information we will report back to you is critically important for our industry to communicate to our customers, community members, shareholders, and regulators. It is also incredibly valuable to document stewardship 
of the ag retailer community and what you are doing voluntarily to help solve water quality problems without additional regulations. Please note that this survey is just for ag retailers within the Great Lakes Basin. And last, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for PARM updates and industry news. After the webinar would be a perfect time to look us up from your computer or mobile device. So now we'll hear from Dr. Bill Curran. Bill is a professor of plant science at Penn State University. Um, so I will switch that over to him. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, let's need to sync my screen, it looks like. Show my screen. Yes. All right. There Here we, we go. go. Looks good. Okay, good. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I'm talking about a, a topic that I talk about a lot. And so I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. And um, we have a, a, a lot of highly erodible land. We have the Chesapeake Bay uh, to the south of us. We have the rivers that uh, distribute potentially nutrients uh, and other pollution uh, into that bay. And so there's a lot of interest in, in cover crops. Uh, also a lot of farmers that are very enthusiastic about um, trying to improve soil health and, uh, and adopting cover crops for, for other reasons. Uh, so today, though, I'm going to... Um, advance this, there we go. I'm going to uh, talk about, um, I guess, maybe some of, the, some of the challenges sometimes that people run into. Uh, in this first slide, just some, some pictures of cover crops so we can start thinking about things. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, so in the Mid-Atlantic region, which is really sort of uh, New York uh, down to, uh, through, for, through Virginia, uh, you can see this is a, a map, I'm sure some of you have seen this before from the USDA uh, ERS showing cover crop adoption, uh, and we have areas in the country where it's it's uh, pretty positive, and others where it's 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 more challenging. And, and uh, uh, being broadcast from Wisconsin today, that's an area uh, as you can see that there's some some challenges. Although certainly uh, maybe uh, more adoption than if we get into, for example, the Dakotas, uh, where we start running into to maybe water uh, availability issues. Um, there's a number of of things that limit uh, or, or challenge adoption. Uh, this is a list from a survey that goes back, I think, from 2013 and 14. You can see a number of reasons why uh, cover crop users find challenges. Um, today, I'm going to hit on two things, um, and I'm calling them part one uh, and part two. And the first is is the impact of herbicides uh, on cover crop establishment. Um, we would hate to uh, select a herbicide program in our corn or soybean crop uh, that prevents us from establishing a cover crop. And so that's kind of what I'm going to touch on today and, and go through some principles associated with that. And then the second one is once we have a, a cover crop established, uh, certainly there's some, some decisions that have to be made in terms of termination timing. Uh, and I'm really focusing on no-till uh, termination for the most part. Um, certainly we can, we can use tillage. Um, and, and there certainly are differences in how effective that can be, but um, I think I get more questions about uh, no-till termination and uh, timing and um, herbicide selection and those sorts of things. And so I'm gonna, gonna talk about that uh, for, for part two. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, part one, uh, impact of herbicides on cover crop establishment. And mostly what we're talking about here, uh, we call them residual herbicides, so most most uh, farmers are using herbicides that they apply to the soil uh, often uh, or generally at, at crop establishment time um, in order to get you know hopefully eight weeks maybe even 12 weeks of, uh, of weed control and sometimes longer so soil residual herbicides um, I'm going to be using the term half-life uh, a number of times in this presentation and so I say if the half-life is too short if the herbicide doesn't last long enough uh, sometimes we lack residual control and we can have uh, weed escapes that can come in maybe later and still impact our crop. And of course, if it's too long, uh, which is more what I'm discussing today, we can have carryover uh, to the following crop, uh, which we know can be uh, problematic. Um, and this is uh, very important for, for some crops uh, and, and certainly those that are established shortly after uh, 
we harvest that cash crop. Um, so I sort of discussed this in, in two, two important aspects. One is, is herbicide persistence. Uh, how long does it last in the soil? And that's where this idea of a half-life comes in. It gives us some indication of how long a herbicide persists. Uh, but secondly, um, what is the rotational crop sensitivity or susceptibility to the herbicide? So how sensitive would a rotational crop be? Um, so if I plant a, a, a small seeded legume like, like a clover, they can often be quite quite sensitive to some herbicide residues. And so the thing to remember that um, if a herbicide persists long, if it has a, ha a relatively long half-life, um, but it's not very active in the soil, um, or if it has a short half-life, if it's short-lived, uh, then those really don't matter very much. So it's really the ones that last a little bit too long and that are active on the crops that we're trying to uh, establish. And so what I usually tell people, um, Sort sort of how do I how do I find out the information that I need to know? And so uh, knowing your herbicide residual, and so certainly one of the first things would be to to check uh, current management guide. Uh, most of the uh, most land grants have weed management guides, um, and they have recrop tables uh, in those guides. This is information that you can find on the on the herbicide labels. It's sort of distilled uh, into a table that may be easier to find than than leafing through a, a long herbicide label, which is you know, the other place that you would look is check the label for use restrictions. Um, there's a number of things that can uh, can be a little confusing and that is often not straightforward. So I have a, a sort of a laundry list there, uh, soil texture and pH. If it's a heavy soil, uh, meaning more clay and organic matter, if the pH is above 7. Uh, some herbicides will last longer uh, in those situations, and, and you can find that fine print uh, often on the label. Uh, if we experience a drought, uh, and particularly uh, if it starts early in the summer um, uh, and moves into the middle of the summer, there's uh, a better chance for having problems. Uh, if we're planting particularly sensitive crops, uh, and here I have tobacco, which we grow some in, in the mid-Atlantic region, but uh, small seeded legumes, alfalfa clovers, uh, ryegrass, uh, those can be problematic sometimes. Um, what rate of herbicide are you using? Um, you know, higher rates going to last longer if I'm applying it pre-emerge uh, versus post-emerge. So if I'm applying it um, in crop and I'm a, I'm a month or six weeks into the season, uh, that might have more of a problem uh, in the fall. Uh, No-till versus tilled systems. Um, I would say the jury is not completely in on this, but certainly we know that uh, when we till a soil, um, that tends to dilute residues, and so maybe we can get away with a little bit more. And then, and then most of the time, uh, we're not using just single active ingredients. We're using uh, herbicide combinations, mixtures, and so you need to consider um, really what what is in the tank and uh, what's being applied to that to that field. So here's a uh, I guess an ad for for our publication. And I, again, um, most states have their own version of this. This is a, a the Mid Atlantic Field Crop Weed Management Guide. I'm going to show you some tables from this, really just as examples. Uh, of the kind of information that you'll you'll find in these guides, and so um, we'll we'll jump right in. So this is a an abbreviated table, and hopefully you can see this. I know some of these some of this text is a little small, but it has the rotation restrictions for for cash crops, and I'm I'm just using some example herbicides here. And so for example, 2,4-D, which is the first one, and most people are from, very familiar with 2,4-D. Uh, it has a it has a short half life uh, that I'll show in a moment. It doesn't last very long, and so if you looked at uh, a table for this kind of information, you'd see that uh, though that AH stands for after harvest. Uh, there are some some things that you can't plant for three months, but for the most part, uh, you can plant almost any crop 30 days after you use you use 2,4-D because it doesn't last very long. Uh, in contrast, uh, the the next four herbicides uh, all have fairly long recrop restrictions, and that's because they they contain um, either atrazine, uh, the second one down, which uh, the SY stands for second year, um, the NY stands for, for next year. So second year, that means you really can't, or you're really not supposed to plant that crop for two years. Uh, and then the others may contain some other active ingredients that, that prohibit uh, recropping very quickly. Um, one of the challenges with a table like this is that you see a lot of, of of crops listed, and these are really cash crops, and and so most of the time these tables do not include some things that we might be con that we might consider as a cover crop. Now there's some exceptions. For example, you see clover in this table, 
uh, you also see the, the winter grains, including cereal rye. So those those can those types of information can be found in a table like this. But for things that are more obscure, uh, you know, hairy vetch, for example, um, uh, maybe radish, uh, forage radish, you're not going to find those typically in this kind of a, a table. If you were to go to a label, and so I have an example here, uh, the Callisto label. Uh, most people that grow corn are familiar with with Callisto. Um, uh, both corn and sweet corn. Uh, this is the kind of information you would find on the label, and so you know, basically, we've tried to distill this in a in the previous type table, uh, where you can quickly see what the timeline is. And and again, you see some things that you could consider maybe cover crops, small grains, for example. You can plant four months after using Callisto. Uh, they include uh, canola. Some people might sometimes use a, a canola canola for a cover crop. You see red clover, 18 months. Um, but again. Oftentimes, it doesn't go into the level of detail that we'd like to have um, if we're thinking about, about cover crops. So I, I come back to, uh, to this slide, and uh, I'm going to sort of uh, dissect this. So the first, the first question, you know, how long does the herbicide persist? Uh, and this is where we, we get to that, that half-life uh, idea. And so I have a graph here uh, that shows uh, along the, what we call the vertical axis along the left there, uh, 0 to 100%. So we make the herbicide application word 100%. And basically, over time, that herbicide dissipates or degrades uh, in the soil. And um, each number along the bottom there is equal to a half-life. Uh, and so there's some period of time that it takes to reach one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, uh, et cetera. And so I'm going to use an example uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, 2,4-D. 2,4-D doesn't last very long. Uh, the, the book value for, for for half-life, 2,4-D is about seven days, and so we go through one half-life in seven days, two in 14 days, three in 21, and four in 28. So basically, uh, within a month, you've gone through four half-lives uh, for 2,4-D, and so the example that I would use, if you apply a, a pint of 2,4-D, uh, seven days later, in theory, you have a half a pint, and then a quarter of a pint, and then an eighth of a pint, and you know within 28 days, there's only uh, potentially a sixteenth of a pint of 2,4-D remaining, which, which generally is not enough um, residue to impact planting almost almost any crop. So well, hence why uh, you can plant almost anything 30 days after using 2,4-D. You know, in contrast, uh, atrazine we know can be problematic sometimes. Um, and, and certainly the, the half-life for atrazine will vary. Uh, if we again look at sort of a, a book value, um, it's 60 days. And so if we use that number for atrazine, so two months before it goes through one half-life, uh, you know, four months for two, uh, et cetera. And so we, we know that in certain, certain situations and in certain soils um, that, you know, atrazine can persist for, for six months uh, or more uh, and can be a potential residue problem. So, um, so again, by knowing that information about half-life, that can be helpful. And so we can sort of categorize herbicides based on half-life. Uh, those that uh, have short half-lives, and, and these are these are somewhat arbitrary categories, but less than 30 days might be short, an intermediate might be 30 to 120 days, uh, and then long uh, more than 120 days. And, and really, um, in agriculture, we don't use anything that is long uh, because of rotation issues. Um, but we do use a lot of things sort of in that intermediate category, and those are the ones probably that we, we really ought to pay most attention to uh, Today in the discussion, um, so if it's less than 30, it's really not a problem. Um, but if it's if it's uh, you know if it's 60 or, or more, then that could be problematic. And so just some example herbicide half lives. Uh, already talked about the first two, two four D. So atrazine, you see some ranges on some of these, and that's because these these are not absolute numbers. Uh, soil type, uh, climate. There's a number of things that will affect the half life. Um, uh, and so you need to be aware of that too. Certainly uh, in the upper Midwest, uh, the upper Corn Belt, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, the Dakotas, things are going to typically last longer. Uh, I mentioned that uh, on some higher uh, soil pHs, that can increase the persistence of things like atrazine in particular. Uh, as we move south uh, into warmer, more mild climates, things, things break down more quickly. And so, so uh, there can be some differences. And so keep that in mind. Uh, you know, I've, I've lived and worked um, in Pennsylvania for uh, almost 30 years now, and so I'm very familiar with, with how herbicides act in my climate and on my soils. 
um, and, and many of you are from other places around the country, and so it's important that you consider uh, you know, where you are, what your rainfall is, what your soil texture, uh, pH is, and that will all potentially impact uh, herbicide persistence. So I'm, I'm, and I work with corn and soybeans too, so that's kind of what I'm focused on here today. Uh, hopefully that's what uh, you're interested in too. And so I just have some, some, uh, some categories, that, another category you might say, and this isn't equivalent to uh, short, medium, and long, but, but things that, are, uh, that persist less than two months, uh, you know, never a problem. Uh, that group in the middle, two to four months, usually not a problem, but you know, could be, and things that persist longer than four months. And this isn't an exhaustive list; these are just examples uh, of corn herbicides that, uh, you know, so the, the more than four months, or equal or more than four months, those would be products that we certainly need to maybe pay closer attention to uh, if we're trying to establish cover crops uh, after corn. And we can do the same sort of thing. Um, for soybean, again, products that, that don't persist very long, those that are sort of in the middle, that are rarely a problem, I would say, and those that um, might persist longer where we need to pay closer attention to, uh, to what we're maybe following those with. So that was the, that's the first part, the, the how long does the herbicide persist? And then the second part would be how sensitive is the rotational crop? Because if the rotational crop's not sensitive, then it really doesn't, doesn't matter that much. So these are just some examples for three herbicides. Uh, bringing up atrazine again. Atrazine is a broadleaf herbicide, uh, and it's it's very effective on on broadleaf weeds, uh, and particularly small seeded broadleaf weeds. And so, uh, if we think about small seeded uh, cash crops or cover crops, those are the ones that we would be uh, most concerned about. So things like alfalfa and clover, uh, radish, I would say canola, uh, but there are some grasses that they also can, it can also impact so small seeded grasses, uh, have ryegrass and timothy. And so um, some differences. Um, so you're going to be able to establish, you know, wheat, barley, rye um, much sooner after using atrazine than you would alfalfa or clover. And, and you see a, a, a trend here with the herbicides that I'm listing, because um, you, you, the sensitive crops are pretty much the same crops across those. So mesotrion, that's our Callisto product, uh, also a corn herbicide. Uh, and then chlorimuron uh, is a soybean herbicide. Um, the, the single active green ingredient is sold as the herbicide classic, uh, but it's in a lot of different products, uh, canopy, all the canopy products uh, in Vive. Uh, so there's a number of uh, Valor XLT, a number of soybean herbicides that contain the active ingredient chlorimuron. So again, how long does the herbicide last? Uh, and then how sensitive are the, uh, the rotational cover crops that we're interested in implanting. So one of the things that we included um, in our guide, actually starting last year, was a, a table that focused on uh, cover crops and herbicide persistence. And what we tried to do in this table was, was uh, provide some, some information um, on half-life in addition to other things. So if, if you look at 2,4-D, the first one at the top, uh, I have listed that it has a seven-day half-life. Uh, if we want to know uh, what, what about fall established cover crops? It's okay to plant any grass. Uh, and really, again, if you wait 30 days, you can pretty much plant almost anything after using 2,4-D. Uh, the second one is our, our atrazine, uh, the rate range that's typically used, uh, half-life information. Uh, certainly, if you're looking at something that's tolerant to, uh, to atrazine, like sorghum, there's no problem. But we know that cereals, ryegrass, legumes, and mustards you know, could be problematic. Uh, depending on, on the rate, and also things like soil pH. Um, so there's a, a bit of a, um, it's a notation on the right-hand side about that. So these are just some examples of products uh, and information about half-life and a table that specifically is focused on, on uh, cover crops that we're, we're trying to try to get out there. So sort of to summarize uh, this first piece, um, I like looking at half-life information. It, at least it gives you a feel for uh, where are we? If it's a if it's a small number, we're okay. If it's a bigger number, you know, we need to pay closer attention. Uh, and just sort of to summarize the the key points for corn and soybean, um, the products that maybe we need to think about most um, for corn. I have I have three active ingredients listed uh, at well four actually atrazine or simazine. Simazine is uh, sold as Princep. That's what most people know it as. Uh, the mesotrion, which is uh, sold as Callisto, but mesotrion is in a lot of different products now. Uh, Lumax, Lexar, Acuron, um, 
uh, a lot of different instigate. Uh, so there's there's a number of products out there now that contain mesotrione, uh, and then clopyrrolid, um, which is uh, the, the, most people would recognize that as Stinger, but it's also a component of uh, Hornet, SureStart. Um, Dow has a new product, Resicor, that has uh, clopyrrolid in it. So uh, those are three that you know, at least probably the probably that I run into the most problems with in terms of of corn, uh, soybean. Uh, I mentioned chlorimiron uh, already, uh, which is in a number of different products. Uh, Imazethapir, which is uh, known as Pursuit. Again, it's also in a number of products. And then one that sometimes surprises people is uh, Femesifen, which uh, the single active ingredient is known as uh, Reflex. It's also, some people know it as uh, Flexstar. Um, Flexstar GT, it has glyphosate with it. Um, that actually has some, um, some issues for excuse me, for small seeded uh, dicots or, or broad leaves as well. So that one sometimes surprises surprises people. Uh, other corn and soybean herbicides, uh, you, know, you know, I would say they're less of a problem, but also maybe a little less clear. Uh, you know, once in a while we'll have a problem. Uh, if you're involved in, in wheat, <coughs> excuse me, most of the wheat products are not problematic. Um, you know, and, and particularly if you're in double crop soybean areas, then um, usually that's an indication that uh, those products are, are not a problem. But that's also where you could, <coughs> excuse me, could run into some, some problems. I would say, in, you know, in, in general, until more re more research is conducted uh, assessing specific herbicide cover crop interactions, you kind of have to rely on some some general guidelines like we're providing uh, in our guide. And, and again, this kind of this kind of information is also included in other guides. <coughs> Got a bit of a frog in my throat, I apologize. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a couple of exceptions to this, and, and the thing I just wanted to touch on briefly was um, we've been involved in, in evaluating um, opportunity for interseeding cover crops, uh, mostly in corn, but perhaps in, in other crops as well. And this is, I would say, this is a whole different ball game. So uh, uh, there's a number of us that have been involved in this where we, we developed this, this high boy drill that can run through corn and, and uh, uh, establish cover crops. And, and we're doing this, you know, uh, weeks after uh, seeding corn. So, you know, you're in there. Uh, seeding cover crops uh, when corn's about V5 or V6. So this is a, a tactic where uh, residual herbicides really could could be problematic. And so uh, the information that I've provided thus far does not really relate. I mean, certainly it's related, um, but but the ones that we can get away with when we post-harvest uh, plant cover crops are quite different than if we're doing this. So I just want to make you aware of this. We've been examining uh, a number of herbicides um, trying to look at shorter residual herbicides, and you, you see some, most of this work, all this work has been in corn that we've looked at, uh, trying to see uh, maybe what we can get away with and, and what can work. And this is a, a project, um, we have about three years of data now, but it's an, an ongoing uh, research product project. And so we've developed, for example, some tables um, that um, is part of my extension program now. Uh, sort of a risk of cover crop injury for some grass herbicides where we're using a, uh, you know, low risk is green, moderate risk uh, is yellow, and then a high risk. And those, you know, high risk would be losing more than 30% of the stand. And so you can see some products and how we're, how we're rating them. And then we've done the same sort of thing um, for broad leaves, uh, again, where we're looking at some products. And, and uh, you know, so there certainly are some materials you have to stay away from. And you can see at the bottom there, you know, high risk products. Uh, if you're particularly if you're seeding if you're seeding clover, which is what we're, we've been doing in, in this research. Um, so something to keep in mind. Again, I'm not going to talk much about. In fact, I'm not going to talk any more about interseeding today. But um, that is a is a special consideration where we really need to think about our herbicide programs and making sure that we're um, you know using products that, that aren't going to be a problem because there's 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 one clear way to have a failed interseeding. Uh, how, to have a failed interseeding crop, and that's if we use the, the wrong herbicide. Okay, so that is uh, sort of part part one, and now I'm going to uh, switch gears and go into part two. And this is the uh, impact of herbicide selection uh, and timing on cover crop termination. 
uh, and this is something that we've worked on, I guess, for a number of years, and, um, and uh, there are still certainly still questions, and I sort of break it into into three categories. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're and again. This has a, a no-till focus, so I hope that that that's your interest as well. Uh, but we're looking at selecting herbicides that are effective uh, on both cover crops and weeds. Uh, remember that it's rare that we don't have some weeds mixed into that cover crop, and particularly um, as we've seen uh, mare's tail or horseweed uh, increase its geography. Um, if you're relying on something like glyphosate, you know, a Roundup type product alone to control a cover crop, uh, you're going to have problems with that that uh, glyphosate resistant weed that might be mixed in. So you need to, to think about both of those. Uh, secondly, um, what about residual herbicides? Can I um, can I add my residual herbicide to my burn down uh, and and make one application? So I'm going to just talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the third one is uh, concern for crop injury with some active ingredients. Um, we've been involved in um, looking at a, a strategy that uh, at least that people are calling mostly are calling planting green, uh, where you're actually planting your cash crop uh, into a, a living uh, cover crop and then coming in uh, and terminating it maybe after you plant. Uh, and so uh, I've been involved in some experiments looking at uh, at herbicides uh, in that sort of a strategy. So those are sort of the three areas that I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on. So if we start off just thinking about what are our primary burn down herbicides, uh, you know, a lot of glyphosate, uh, Roundup being used out there, that is that is certainly the number one. Uh, I would say some areas there's more Paraquat uh, that's coming to, in, come into play, also the most common trade name is Gramoxone. Um, because of the mare's tail uh, horseweed issue, uh, there's been increased use of glufosinate, that's Liberty. Um, that's usually, we think of that as being used in Liberty Link crops, but um, it also has some use in, in, uh, in burn down, mostly for mare's tail control, and I'm really not going to say much about that today. Uh, and then the last group are the what we call the plant growth, regula plant growth regulators, uh, things like 2,4-D, uh, dicamba, uh, which is known as Banville or Clarity, uh, and then and then clopyrrolid, which is which is Stinger. So those are often things that we might have in the mix uh, when we're trying to kill uh, cover crops and and also uh, emerged weeds. So I have another table. Uh, this is an abbreviated table, and it shows. And again, this is the kind of table that would be in a lot of different guides. Uh, effectiveness of herbicides for control of common cash or cover crops in spring, and I, I sort of cherry picked uh, some species there. But you see some herbicides along the left, and some weeds, uh, or no, excuse me, not weeds, cover crops along the top. And I went ahead and I picked one that um, maybe be particularly uh, uh, challenging at times. That's annual ryegrass. We know annual ryegrass uh, is not the easiest thing to control or, or to terminate. Uh, and if you look down this list, uh, and these are our ratings on a 6 to, to 10 scale, actually N means that it doesn't have any activity. Uh, you wouldn't want to choose anything that was a 6. What you'd like to find is a 10, and there isn't anything for ryegrass that's a 10. Uh, but the best we can have is glyphosate uh, at the higher rate, which gives us a 9, which is uh, 85 to 95 percent control by definition. And so, and, and, and really, this, this is just scratching the surface, there's also some things that we need to do that you would find in some remarks uh, associated with these associated tables that would tell you, you know, how you need to apply that glyphosate uh, to make sure that you get uh, optimum activity. But this is certainly a place to start where you look at, at a table that tells you how effective a different herbicide, a burn down herbicide is. And, and then you would also want to look at um, how well does that control any weeds. Uh, so for example, if I had glyphosate resistant mare's tail, is one of the weeds mixed in with my annual ryegrass, we certainly would need to be thinking about things other than just, just glyphosate. And we can do the same sort of thing for, uh, for soybean. Um, maybe we're, we're growing a cereal rye cover crop, and there are, are a number of herbicide programs that are pretty effective on, on cereal rye. But again, think about the cereal rye, and then also if there's any weeds that are associated with that, that cover crop, so that we're making sure that we're accounting for them as well. So just some, some key points about those key products that we tend to be using uh, in, in burn down programs. You know, glyphosate's been in the marketplace for, for decades now. Um, and most people are really familiar with it. Uh, it's a, it has a, a huge utility 
uh, in no-till and, and, and certainly for managing cover crops. Um, you know, it, it actually is better on grasses than broadleaves. Uh, it tends to be weak on legumes. I, I've learned that the hard way, uh, that if, if I had, for example, uh, red clover as a cover crop or hairy vetch, uh, glyphosate is not the product that you would use to try to terminate that cover crop. Um, certainly uh, some, some things that most people uh, understand that uh, annual weeds are easier to kill when they're small and as they mature they become more difficult. And one thing that I'm surprised that um, people still don't recognize is that uh, it's easy to antagonize the activity of glyphosate. And so that last bullet point, the tank mixtures, um, if, you, if you tank mix certain herbicides with glyphosate, uh, it, it reduces the activity. And it either requires a higher rate uh, of glyphosate or, and or maybe some additional uh, adjuvants or perhaps even switching to a different herbicide. So I said particularly uh, the triazine herbicide. So atrazine uh, or metabuzin tank mix with glyphosate uh, reduces the activity uh, by really as much as about 50%. And so um, sometimes things die much more slowly or else it's just not adequate to, to do the job. So some things that uh, you'd want to recognize with glyphosate. Um, you know, the second most widely used burn down herbicide would be Paraquat, sold as Cremoxone. Uh, also some things that uh, uh, I think people recognize, but maybe um, we ought to review uh, that, that, that fourth bullet point tank mix with a, a, a PS2 herbicide to increase control. And so this is the exact opposite of glyphosate. Uh, we want to try to tank mix um, an atrazine or a, or a metabuzin with, with paraquat because it increases the activity because basically the, uh, the, photosynthesis, the photosynthesis inhibitor, the atrazine or the metabuzin, actually works in concert um, with paraquat and its mode of action and so it increases the activity. Uh, and then the other thing that um, often people forget is that last bullet point that if I have a, a cereal rye cover crop or, or a wheat cover crop, um, that there are certain times when we can do a much better job with paraquat than other times. And so if we apply it prior to tailoring, so when it's small or after boot stage, uh, it works much better than if we make that application between tailoring and boot stage. And so sometimes we can see some, some failures or at least some um, inadequate control if we're spraying uh, sewer rye with, with, with paraquat, and particularly if we don't have atrazine or metabuzin with it, if it's applied um, when rye is uh, sort of pre-boot. And then the other group that I'll just mention, again, the, the PGR herbicides. Um, these are often necessary if we have a legume uh, in the mix. Um, you need that 2,4-D, certainly for red clover, uh, white clover, actually crimson clover, glyphosate's pretty good on crimson clover. One of the things that we're discussing around here uh, this year, it's been a mild winter uh, in, in uh, many regions. Uh, we have a lot of farmers that, uh, that are using uh, forage radish uh, as a cover crop, and in some areas it looks like that potentially won't winter kill. Uh, this is a good example of a situation where glyphosate is not very good on, on forage radish. And so as we move into the spring, and if we have some fields where we didn't get uh, winter kill, uh, of that, we might need to think about uh, including a, a plant growth regulator herbicide with glyphosate. And I just have some slides from some of the uh, trials that we've done. Uh, this is from a few years back, uh, and, it, and it's looking at glyphosate uh, on the left uh, versus cremoxone or paraquat plus metabuzin uh, on the right. Uh, and it, this is a slide that was taken about 10 days uh, after we made the application. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of Obvious people that use Gramoxone, um, oftentimes because they want uh, quick desiccation, they want quick kill, uh, where the glyphosate is much more slow, slowly acting. Uh, if we're uh, if we're under cooler uh, temperatures in in earlier spring, Gramoxone uh, tends to be a little bit more be more consistent depending on what the cover crop is. So there's certain situations where uh, you might think about Gramoxone over glyphosate, uh, and then and then vice versa. Uh, really, you know, what's your sort of what's your goal? And just a, another key point that I tried to make that uh, adding that photosynthesis inhibitor to gramoxone or paraquat is can be really important. Uh, and this shows uh, gramoxone on the right by itself, or gramoxone plus an anionic surfactant on the right, and then gramoxone plus uh, metabuzin, that's what Sencor was, uh, on the left, also with an anionic surfactant. And this is 11 days after application. And, uh, it just really enhances uh, the speed of desiccation and, and improves uh, overall control. 
And so if we went back into that field, actually this is a, a few weeks, uh, well, almost uh, almost exactly a month after application, uh, that gramoxone uh, alone application, and that was that cereal rye, uh, didn't really provide full control, uh, and we got a little bit of regrowth uh, with the straight gramoxone application. And, and you could overcome that maybe by increasing the rate a little bit, but uh, my suggestion would be to, to add, uh, you know, three or four ounces of, of uh, metribuzin, or you add uh, atrazine uh, if you're going into corn. So that sort of is the first part. Uh, the second part is what about uh, residual herbicides? And I get this question quite a bit. Uh, if we put a residual herbicide in with our our uh, our burn down, um, you know, are there concerns for spray coverage? Do I need to make a separate application? Uh, and I and I don't think there's any clear cut uh, yes or no for this. Um, there are a lot of residual burn down partners that are being used now, uh, you know, we're really recommending that, um, particularly in soybean, well, it's always been used in corn, but more and more now in soybean uh, to help manage uh, herbicide resistant weeds, and so can you go in and, and make a single pass uh, with, with uh, the glyphosate, the gramoxone, uh, and, and the burn down. Um, and so this is something that um, we've actually tried to get more involved in and tried to study. Um, you know, can cover crops impact residual herbicide activity? And so this just shows three images from a study that, that we've been doing where we're looking at no cover, uh, a cereal rye cover uh, at burn down, and then a rye plus hairy vetch cover. And, and those little yellow, uh, those are little yellow spray cards, water sensitive paper um, that, that help detect uh, what your spray pattern is. And so we have been relying on these to see what sort of uh, impact we could see from a cover crop in terms of how many of those drops uh, are actually hitting hitting the ground, and so if you had a if you had a residual herbicide in there and you were concerned about actually reaching the soil and, and uniformly applying it, would that cover impact that? And I would say in general, if you're if you're standing above the cover crop uh, and you can see clearly see soil, um, that it's probably not going to be too big a problem. But if if you're in a uh, I guess what I would call a jungle of cover crop, like on, on the left there, uh, or something like hairy vetch that's very viney, uh, and you're trying to include your residual herbicide in, in a situation like that, that you can be problem that it can be problematic. So as an example, uh, here's you know the three spray cards, uh, and now you know, we're not trying to improve performance. So this is using a, a low drift nozzle tip. Uh, I think we use 15 gallons of water per acre, uh, and so you know choosing a different tip. Uh, increasing your gallonage, uh, you might improve that, but I, I think there are some covers where you're you're going to run into to problems, and where it might make more sense to well, where it would make more sense to uh, make that residual application uh, separately. So, um, the last the last piece uh, is concern for crop injury uh, with with some actives. Uh, I mentioned this isn't usually a problem, but we've had. Uh, sort of a, an enthusiastic group of, of growers in, in our region that are very interested in, in this planting green concept where you plant before you spray your herbicide. Uh, and so that's, that's got us thinking about what could potentially be uh, problematic. Um, we have a graduate student, uh, her name is Heidi Meyer, she's a, a PhD student, um, and she's doing a number of things focused on this planting green, including looking at slugs and, uh, and crop performance, a little bit about weeds. Uh, I'm involved in this. You know, most of the interest in this tactic is uh, focuses on soil quality. Uh, you know, growing bigger cover crops, adding more carbon back to the soil. Uh, most folks are using mixtures of species. Um, I would say, in general, it, we're seeding those typically at maybe lower rates, so we don't want high biomass. That's not usually a goal. Uh, but also, these are all uh, these tend to be uh, no-till enthusiasts, and so we're we're certainly terminating them with with, with cover crops, and so. Um, just a, a photo, this is one of our, our farmers uh, actually in uh, uh, central Pennsylvania uh, planting it into a, a pretty big rye cover crop. So this is sort of what I would call planting grain. Uh, and then he would typically come in there uh, and spray that, that rye cover crop uh, either the same day or within, within the day or two uh, of planting with his herbicide. So just some special considerations for the, for this sort of thing, uh, you know, glyphosate. Uh, make sure that the uh, that the seed is covered well. Uh, if you're using glyph if you're using glyphosate, you certainly want to probably be using a Roundup Ready uh, variety. Uh, 
just to ensure that you don't have any problems uh, with, with Gramoxone or Paraquat. We certainly want to cover the seed again and, and want to make that application before crop emergence, which usually isn't a problem. Probably the biggest concern comes from the PGR herbicides, uh, so things like 2,4-D and, and, and dicamba. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Other herbicides, not usually a problem. Uh, you know, could be uh, uh, crop and herbicide specific, though. And then that last bullet point relates to the comment that I made before. If we're applying a residual herbicide, um, apply residual herbicide after burn down if you have a large, dense cover crop present. So and I, I sort of throw this out there if it's more than 12 inches tall. Uh, but really, I think if you can't see the soil, and you know that that residual herbicide is, is going to get um, intercepted by the cover crop and you're relying then on rainfall to wash it off in a uniform fashion <clears throat> that can be that can sometimes be a problem. So just some specifics about the, the plant growth regulator herbicides and this is this is information that actually is right on a, a 2,4-D label that if uh, we're going to use it pre-plant and we're planting corn uh, we want to delay planting a minimum of set, we want to delay corn must Planting of corn must be delayed a minimum of seven days after application of 2,4-D up to a point, or 14 days it rates up to one to two points. And then uh, if we're using a pre-emerge, actually what you want to do is you, you'd like that corn seed to germinate and imbibe. Um, and so actually there, so if you delay, you could delay application a little bit uh, if you've already planted your corn. And certainly the seed for real uh, must be com could be completely closed to the application because that's that's probably where you have, see our biggest issue. If you don't put the seed deep enough, or you don't close the slit, um, and the herbicide comes in direct contact with, with the seed, the germinating seed. Most folks are pretty familiar with the grow soybeans and use no-till with the, the guidelines for 2,4-D. Uh, you know the general guideline that you can use a pint uh, of 2,4-D uh, at least seven days ahead of planting. That's fairly well understood. Uh, if, if you want to use more than a pint, uh, it, it ranges from, from 15 to 30 days, depending on the product that, that you're using. <clears throat> Some folks are using uh, dicamba uh, in corn, Clarity or Banville uh, burn down in corn, um, and there are some restrictions with that as well. Again, a, 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 it's maybe a liability statement, direct contact of Clarity with corn seed must be avoided. Uh, if corn seeds are less than one and a half inches below the soil surface, delay application in corn has until corn has emerged. And, and that's a general rule for these this group of herbicides that once that corn's spiking, um, it's pretty tolerant uh, to either 2,4-D or dicamba. But if it if it takes up 2,4-D or dicamba when that seed is in, is first imbibing moisture, uh, that's where we can see our, our biggest problem. And then you can also see with with the dicamba products that um, there are some soil texture. Uh, uh, and organic matter and use rate uh, restrictions. So uh, the main point here is just be familiar that there are, there are some uh, restrictions on uh, on how we use these in, in corn. So sort of some take homes um, for this last point: the the, the injury planting green in corn. Uh, if if we're and if we're killing the herb, if we're killing the cover crop, you know, 10 to 14 days ahead of, of planting, then really it's not much of an issue. But the closer you get to, uh, to planting and termination, uh, we want to think about things a little bit more. Make sure the seeds are well planted uh, and well covered. Uh, if, um, if you're using 2,4-D or uh, dicamba, delay application until after seeds have germinated but prior to emergence, or you could put them on at spike. Uh, better to apply later than earlier unless you apply at least seven days ahead of planting. Right, So that's that 10 to 14, you're really good to go. And then certainly, uh, there's a number of farmers that um, are likely going to adopt some new herbicide resistant or tolerant uh, crop varieties, extend soybeans uh, and corn, excuse me, extend soybeans and enlist corn and soybeans, uh, which have uh, resistance to, to some of these plant growth regulator herbicides. And, and that could be a, that could open up a whole other door uh, to opportunities, uh, maybe for better weed control, better cover crop management uh, uh, in burn down programs. So that's what I have um, for today, and uh, I'm going to give it back to uh, Anna, and uh, she can open it up for questions if there are any. Yes, okay. Um, let me get it back to my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bill. You've done a wonderful job, and I think we are fortunate 
to have all this valuable information available to us today. We do have some time for uh, Q&A, so uh, audience members, please uh, enter your questions into the question box on your screen. I do have a couple to get us going. Um, so, Bill, uh, the first one, uh, are there any differences that need to be considered in heavily tiled drain systems? For example, is half-life shorter after rains due to more rapid movement of the soil? That's an interesting question, and one that I've never uh, been posed. So, um, in tile drain systems, would we need to consider uh, half-lives being different? I, w I would say no, uh, that we wouldn't, because um, there you're, you're, you know, you're looking at the herbicide potentially leaving the system, leaving the field, um, and and it's going to do that with rainfall, uh, regardless of whether there's a, a. So once it's washed below the rooting zone, um, it's really gone uh, in terms of any sort of in terms of any sort of injury or carryover injury so whether it uh, leaches into a tile line or it uh, just simply leaches away uh, that's not not really going to be a factor and I would also say that most of our herbicides um, typically do not leach I, don't wanna, I guess I want to make that sort of clear they're fairly um, non-mobile they tend to, to stay in that you know, upper two or three inches where the primary way that the herbicides leave the field uh, is through microbial degradation. And so bacteria principally, but also fungi breaking them down. So um, I, I don't think that leaching uh, and tile drains really are, are, are going to impact uh, persistence. Okay. Uh... Well, our next question, uh, for growing or for growers using a crimper either on or before their corn planter, when would you recommend terminating crop? Before planting or after planting and crimping? Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah I, I've gotten into uh, discussions with people about that. And, and um, so, so first off, uh, roller crimping, um, and hopefully it sounds like some folks are familiar with that, but that's uh, popular in, in some areas and, and it's kind of used two different ways. One would be um, some of our organic growers uh, use it to kill cover crops um, so that they can try to no-till. There you're, you're typically waiting for the cover crop to get fairly mature. Cereal rye would be one of the best examples where you need to wait for it to get sort of well into flowering before you can kill it. The other tactic that uh, where roller crimpers are typically used is where they are used in conventional no-till systems where we would combine them with a herbicide. So we might either spray and then roll crimp or we might roll crimp and then spray. Um, and, and then you don't have to wait so long uh, for the cover crop to become so mature and potentially potentially big. The real question is is if you're, if you're planting um, into a pretty big mature cover crop, uh, is it better to roll and then plant or to plant and then roll? And and that um, that depends is the is the answer. Uh, you know we've had pretty good success with rolling and then planting. Um, that does require um, I would say specialized uh, planting equipment, things that can handle that amount of residue. And and I would say that in general, um, if you're dealing with big large cover crops like that, and you're planting either into a roll crop or even before you roll. You know, I think the key is is having a no-till planter that's set up with, uh, you know, trash managers. Um, we've used um, uh, Yetter Shark Teeth. Uh, there's a number of things that you can use uh, to sort of clear uh, the residue because because the the end result is what you don't want is you don't want to stuff residue down into the seed slit um, and have hair hair pinning and, and uh, issues like that. And, and so I, I'm sort of hemming and hawing around your question, and I apologize, but it's because it's some, it, it really depends on uh, each situation, and I, I've seen both work, and I've seen both fail. And so I, I, I'm not sure that there's a, you know, an absolute recipe, uh, but certainly, certainly having the right planting equipment um, and playing around with that and figuring out, figuring out what works for you is really important before you try rolling and planting or planting and rolling uh, into a, a big, for example, rye cover crop. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing a few questions. Uh, could you clarify what the uh, best herbicide for rapeseed termination in corn production mm -hmm. is? Yeah, so I, I made a comment um, 
about one of the one of the concerns this year in at least south of me is that uh, radish, uh, forage radish or oilseed radish, daikon radish, which has become a pretty popular cover crop, might not winter kill when it normally does. And so I would throw uh, rapeseed uh, or canola uh, uh, brassica species into that same category. In in that uh, the main thing is that glyphosate alone is not very effective on on uh, it's not very active on brassicas, and so um, what you're going to need to do is certainly if you if you if you normally use glyphosate in your burn down program, then you certainly want to use 2,4-D, a pint of 2,4-D with glyphosate, and that that should work well. Um, the alternative would be to use gramoxone, paraquat, and even if I use if if you use gramoxone or paraquat and you use you know, again, I, I emphasize the importance of including uh, an atrazine or a metribuzin with that. That can work also pretty well. Um, you probably could add, you could add 2,4-D to that, but it, it may not be needed. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, how would you rank a grass herbicide such as Post Plus for controlling annual rye? So, uh, Annual rye grass, and I think he's probably probably means annual rye grass. Um, and if you were to, we know that there's some challenges sometimes with glyphosate. Uh, I mentioned that 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 um, under particularly under cool weather, cloudy weather, um, that glyphosate is very slow acting. Um, unfortunately, I would say that uh, in general, those grass herbicides, Post Plus, Select, uh, Fusilade, Fusion, Targa. That you can sort of take your pick. Uh, that those tend to, to also have the same problem. Um, that that they have activity, but their activity really depends uh, on environmental conditions. Uh, one thing that has maybe had a little bit of success is tank mixing um, one of those products. Uh, I've done some work with with Select, uh, which is called Clethodem, and there are a number of, of uh, versions of that in the marketplace. But tank mixing Select with glyphosate. Uh, for control of ryegrass, uh, and that can improve control. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't. So I wouldn't suggest trying to rely on one of those grass herbicides by itself. I think that the combination with glyphosate can improve control. But it, but in general, what what my feeling is is that um, really a well-timed glyphosate application that's by itself. Uh, you're not tank mixing anything that might antagonize it. Uh, you're making sure that you know you got decent weather. Uh, you know, 50s or maybe higher degree uh, daytime temperature um, using um, that one and a half pounds, which would be uh, 44 fluid ounces of a, of a Roundup product is what that's equivalent to. Um, you know, adding ammonium sulfate to it, um, you know, using tips that produce a nice spray pattern, that, that typically is, is how we achieve um, the best ryegrass control. Okay. Um, so another question. Uh, it says, in one table, Callisto was listed as a 5 to 50 day half-life. In another table, it was listed as a uh, over four month uh, half-life for degradation. Uh, these slides seem to conflict. Can you clarify? <laughs> Boy, good eye. Glad you're paying attention. Um, so I'm, I, I know I'm familiar with the, the five to fifty, and so that was the, the half-life information um, range that I provided in the table. I'm trying to remember what where, where it actually said more than that. But so the one that with the single value is probably a is a book value, uh, probably that is contained within the herbicide handbook, and I would say that is an older value, and and the, so the range would be more recent, uh, and the one that I would rely on. Uh, with the idea that remember that these numbers are, are not absolute um, for all locations, and that oftentimes um, depends. And I, I made the I made the uh, gave the example of if you're uh, in the north, if you're in the northern Corn Belt and it's colder climate, heavier soils, uh, you could expect uh, Callisto to persist longer, uh, so closer to 50, uh, than if you're uh, in Arkansas or Mississippi, uh, where maybe it's five. And so, so all these herbicides really have have ranges of half life. So 2,4-D is not not just seven. That that is a a book value uh, that we tend to use. You know, the reality with even just 2,4-D, it might be you know three to ten. 
Um, and so just sort of keep that in mind that there's sort of averages. And, and, uh, what's, and the other thing would be with mesotrion or cholesterol would be that it's, it, it is a newer herbicide, and so people are actually still looking at that. Um, and so new studies come out that have new values, and so that's why that range is there. So I, I would rely on the range. Okay. Um, we have another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on bidirectional nozzles on coverage for larger cover crop termination? Interesting. That's an interesting question. So I, I, um, I have not um, recently looked at, at bidirectional nozzles. So, for example, twin tip nozzles, um, uh, which which could potentially improve things. Uh, I can tell you, when I was a, a graduate student many years ago, uh, I did a study uh, with twin tip twin tip nozzles looking at paraquat. Um, on control of mostly weed species as opposed to cover crop species, but uh, so so that would be where you might see some advantage with a, a contact herbicide uh, like Paraquat, where where coverage uh, is everything. Um, I would also say that nozzle technology has changed a lot since I was a graduate student, and that I'm not sure that um, you couldn't achieve the same t the same thing today with a um, you know with a single orifice nozzle as you could with a twin tip. Uh, making sure that you you uh, you you're going to want smaller droplets, you're going to want uh, higher gallonage, uh, things like uh, glyphosate, uh, systemic herbicides, and if you're talking about trying to get you know residual herbicides down on the soil, um, you know again I'm not I'm not sure that would make that big a difference. Uh, you know you probably would have to be under higher pressure. You're probably you know you're probably looking at more fines. Uh, you, the drift potential is going to go up. Um, I guess I, I think you could solve some things with nozzle technology, um, but if you have a really dense cover crop that, that where you're trying to penetrate that canopy and reach the ground um, with a residual herbicide, I, I think you're going to be challenged, even with a, even with a, a twin tip. Okay. Uh, do you see the high boy cover crop seeding technology developing to the point where egg retailers could offer custom seeding with that technology? So high boy interseeder. Um, so there's a lot of things certainly happening in that um, that area. Uh, I think we're at the point right now where it is starting to get scaled up. Uh, there are a number of um, there's three or four people now that are offering uh, that type of equipment uh, around the country. Uh, they're getting bigger, um, you know, 12 row, 16 row. Um, that still is a bit of a challenge because it's quite different than than um, you know, aerial application, for example, where you can cover, you know, thousands of acres fairly quickly. Um, one thing that we're seeing in, in our area, um, and again, you know, in Pennsylvania, we tend to have smaller farms um, and a lot of no-till, a lot of hills, as we've actually seen some conservation districts uh, buy uh, interseeders and then they rent them out to farmers. So I think this is fairly common in a number of states where conservation districts uh, we're promoting no-till and, and uh, would rent out no-till drills. We're seeing sort of the same thing with, with interseeders now. Uh, and I think I think that if the practice caught on uh, more, uh, that certainly retailers, uh, private retailers, could get could get involved in that. I think we're still trying to show, uh, you know, where it works and where it doesn't. Um, sort of show some consistency. Um, and you know, and, and there's there are I can tell you from my my own experience there are. Um, you know, there are at least, I don't know, there, there's 40 uh, interseeders that I know of out and around, mostly the upper Midwest, um, that were built here in Pennsylvania uh, with a lot of either university researchers, uh, ARS scientists, and farmers sort of testing those and, and trying to, uh, you know, fine-tune them. So I think once, once we uh, sort of prove that the technology is working and, and where it works best, uh, I think it could spread into the private sector more. Okay, great. Uh, we probably only have time for one last question. Um, so, some growers in my area use some extravagant mixes of cover crop seed. Could you get into trouble uh, or have more chemical expense by having to kill multiple species of cover crops? Um, yeah, so cover crop cocktails, mixtures. Um, that's something that I, I have not personally looked at, so I haven't tried to kill, you know, some of these, I know some of these, uh, certainly 
uh, six or seven species mixes, probably not too problematic, but when you get up to, you know, 20 or even 30 species mix mixes, um, I would say, you know, in general, that if you have a, a mixture of, of glyphosate plus 2,4-D, uh, gramoxone plus metribuzin plus 2,4-D, um, that, that that's typically going to cover the bases pretty well um, for even the mixes. Um, you know, there could be issues, for example, if you had uh, a mix where you have species that don't, don't I guess, where the herbicide doesn't reach uh, the cover crop because it's being covered by other cover crops. Um, and so, lo and behold, uh, you end up have, up some, have something at the bottom of that mix that lives uh, and doesn't die. Um, and maybe that's, that's sort of a coverage question again. Uh, so if you have low-growing things versus things that get big and, and, and above the canopy. Um, so I, I think it's something that we should be looking at more. Uh, I haven't looked at that. Um, you know, I guess the simple answer is I don't think it'll be a big deal, but it, it, it could be. It could be under certain certain circumstances. Those are great questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. I want to thank Bill for joining us today. Uh, really helpful information for everyone. Um, so. At this time, I want to recognize our participating ag retailers. If you are an ag retailer in the Great Lakes Basin that is interested in participating in this partnership to benefit your business and water quality, please contact me after the webinar. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funders and collaborators that made this webinar possible, in particular the support of the Great Lakes Protection Fund and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, as we wrap up, please remember to look for the email later this afternoon with the webinar evaluation, webinar recording, Parm Ag Retailer Products and Services Survey, and a link to submit your CCA credentials to earn the 1.5 CCA CEUs. Uh, I want to thank you all again for joining us today, and I hope you join us again for our next webinar, which will be in June. Thank you. <laughs>